The Battle of Britain was the first large-scale military campaign in history to be fought exclusively in the air. And according to many leading historians, the confrontation nearly brought Britain to its knees, an outcome that undoubtedly would have had a significant influence on the course of the Second World War. I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian, and today I'll be explaining why the Battle of Britain was fought and how the British were able to best their German foes. But first, a word from our sponsor, War Thunder. War Thunder is a realistic, free-to-play vehicle combat game. By downloading, you can fight with millions of players from all over the world in combined arms battles in the air, on land, and at sea. The game has more than 1,000 historically accurate playable tanks, aircraft, and ships from the 1930s all the way up to the 1990s. The planes that took part in the Battle of Britain are among them. If you want to join the battle, the game is available on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. Stay tuned for an exclusive offer from the War Thunder team. The angry buzzing of the planes increased, and the bombs rained down, literally rained down. We hugged the side of the building. Now the fires appeared. A large bomb dropped across the river, burst in a brilliant orange, and then spurted high into the air. There were warehouses over there. One by one they caught fire. The fire engines clanged sharply, and then the air was filled with a great hissing as the water met the flames. This was the experience of Quentin Reynolds, as recounted in Gavin Mortimer's book, The Longest Night. Events such as these were commonplace by the spring of 1941, but by this time, the Blitz, as it came to be known, was drawn to a close. It had been seven months since air combat between Germany and Britain intensified, and the situation was looking grim. Reynolds states that, London remained the center of the free world's resistance to Hitler's Germany, but its all-in-together camaraderie was disintegrating. The city's civil defenses were chronically undermanned, as the breezy enthusiasm of those who volunteered in 1939 cracked under the incessant bombing. So how did Britain arrive at this point? Let's start at the beginning. Waging war on Britain was never one of Hitler's grandiose ambitions. He much preferred to make peace with the British, even offering them the chance to keep their empire in return for aligning themselves with Germany. Some elements of the British government jumped at the possibility to secure a ceasefire, but others, namely Churchill, were not so keen to do so. We shall defend our island. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Those that shared Churchill's sentiments ultimately came out on top, and Hitler resolved to force Britain to pursue peace. Shattering British morale was a prerequisite. Since early June, the German Luftwaffe had been launching reconnaissance missions over the British mainland, and in July, they began engaging convoys in the English Channel in an effort to hurt British shipping. On July 16th, Hitler and his senior command began planning Operation Sea Lion, with the intention of mounting a joint amphibious airborne attack on Britain. Hitler announced that, Where Napoleon failed, I shall succeed. I shall land on the shores of Britain. Needless to say, the plan was an ambitious one, but up to that point Nazi Germany had been invincible on the battlefield. The period that followed Hitler's proclamation is known as Spitfire Summer, a fiery clash that pitted more than 1,300 German fighters against just 700 British fighters. Although the British Royal Air Force, or RAF, was almost invariably outnumbered in these skirmishes, the British made effective use of radar. This allowed the RAF to keep its fighters grounded until enemy targets were spotted. They could then be engaged with the benefit of foresight. As a result, Luftwaffe pilots often reported that it seemed that the British were always expecting them ahead of time. On the 1st of August, 1940, the Luftwaffe changed their strategy. Up until that point, the German Air Force had mostly focused on targeting British shipping routes and ports in an attempt to starve Britain out. Now it was bent on gaining total air superiority over the RAF, launching upwards of 1,000 attacks a day. Later in the month, the Luftwaffe specifically honed in on RAF airfields and factories that produced aircraft parts. 1,270 German fighters and 520 bombers were directed to what became known as the Eagle Attack. But radar once again kept Britain in the fight. The industrial outskirts of London were regularly bombed, but London itself was not to be touched without Hitler's express approval. 
In retaliation against the German bombing campaign, the RAF Bomber Command conducted night raids that hurt German shipbuilding efforts, making the prospect of a successful German amphibious landing even less viable than it already was given the British Royal Navy's control of both the English Channel and the North Sea. 80 British bombers were also dispatched to raid the outskirts of Berlin, targeting industrial and commercial targets. But due to cloudiness, some of the bombs fell across the city and resulted in civilian casualties. At this point, Germany was losing the air campaign to the United Kingdom. The Germans did not do as much damage to British production as they suspected. Even by the middle of August, the British were producing double the amount of fighters than the Germans were. Furthermore, German fighters had limited range and could only escort bombers flying over Britain for part of their missions. Often this resulted in bombers being left vulnerable and shot down by British fighters. Moreover, since the Luftwaffe was in enemy territory, when an aircraft was shot down, an entire trained crew was lost. If a British plane was shot down, on the other hand, the crew could rejoin the RAF. There had been reported cases of RAF pilots being downed and rejoining the battle on the same day. Additionally, Britain was also able to enlist the aid of experienced pilots from France, Czechoslovakia, and Poland especially. As a consequence of these factors, Hitler delivered a speech in which he denounced Britain and promised retribution to the German people. When the British Air Force drops two or three thousand kilograms of bombs, then we will drop in one night 150, 250, 300, or 400,000 kilograms. When they declare that they will increase their attacks on our cities, then we will raise their cities. Sure enough, a bloody revenge followed. Saturday, September 7th, 1940. This was the beginning of the Blitz. Bombs spewed out of aircraft and fell with murderous intensity on London's East End. There were 430 dead as night edged in, and elsewhere across London, people watched with bemusement. Why, they asked each other, was the sun setting in the East as well as the West? For the next 57 consecutive days, raids continued day and night, causing most people to take solace in air raid shelters. British air raid sirens became a common sound for those living in London and other major cities, but even those living in the countryside were not safe. One of the worst incidents to have occurred during the Blitz involved the destruction of a school that was used as an air raid shelter, which resulted in 450 civilian deaths. Some 2,700 Luftwaffe aircrew members had been killed, over 1,000 had been captured, and more than 1,880 German aircraft were shot down. By comparison, British military casualties numbered some 500 aircrew killed and 60 captured. Throughout the campaign, the RAF was under the able leadership of the resolute and forward-looking Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding, who picked his battles wisely. Due to the Luftwaffe's numerical superiority, German planes were not always engaged. Instead, RAF planes were used sparingly to prevent Germany from gaining the air superiority it so desperately needed to defeat Britain. The commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Göring, is considered by most historians to have been the inferior air commander, and although many consider him to be Dowding's equal in resolve, Göring lacked Dowding's strategic foresight and innovative mindset. The Battle of Britain is generally considered a watershed moment in the Second World War, culminating in Nazi Germany's first major military defeat. Hitler's decision to put his invasion of the United Kingdom on hold and turn east to invade the Soviet Union was born largely out of a growing need for oil to fuel the German war machine. The decision gave Britain precious time to rebuild its military following Allied defeat in continental Europe. It also served to sway public opinion in the United States at a time when the vast majority of Americans opposed joining the struggle in Europe. We'll conclude by quoting Winston Churchill, who upon reflecting on the confrontation eloquently asserted that, Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. And now back to our sponsor. War Thunder is genuinely one of my favorite games. I've actually got all of the British mid-tier planes unlocked. We invite all of you to join us on the battlefield for free by using the link in the description below. By following this link, you will gain access to your choice between a premium tank or premium aircraft and three days of premium time. Once again, our link can be found in the description below.
I'd like to thank my general staff on Patreon. Fritz, Joe Crispin, Brandon Wuwan, Derek Bello, Jake Hart, Pagan Butler, PJ Knave, Eric Greenwood, Patrick Reardon, John Graham, James Thompson, Jim Talbot, Dimitri Stillerman, and everyone else listed on screen. I'd also like to thank our team, David Mianyar, Hert Boss, and Alexander Blake for making this video possible.